Well, good evening, everyone, to our second Just War seminar. Uh, this week, you have the pleasure of Edward Hadass. And Edward spent a couple of decades in business, in the real world, and also several years in journalism. He was assistant editor, including assistant stints as assistant editor on the rather influential Lex column in the Financial Times and in Reuters, where he still, I think, at least until very recently, I think he still uh, regularly contributes their, on the, uh, to their online service. But over the last uh, year or so, Ed and I, or Edward and I, have been discussing just war. And his, you're about to hear his rather marvellous paper, which I had the pleasure of reading over the, uh, 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 well, last week, which is absolutely wonderful. You're going to hear it now. And I'm not going to speak too much more about him. He's thought very deeply about all this stuff. He's got a book coming out, a much needed book on Catholic social teaching, by the way, which I think will, if it's as, as enjoyable as his paper this evening, will be quite marvellous. It's much needed that. He's already written a couple of works already on economics. Just one thing before we kick off. If you've got a question for him, down at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see a little icon which says questions. You know. If you write your questions in there, and what we'll do is, when he finishes this in about 40 minutes time, I'll, I'll put the questions to him on your behalf. Anyway, enjoy this, uh, and uh, uh, that's all from me for now. Over to you, Edward. Great. Thank you, Frank. Um, and um, I should say that this, is, this lecture is really the fruit of the a wonderful and frightening dialogue that Frank and I have had. Um, over many years, because what I don't know about war is pretty vast. Um, so Frank has really instructed me. And what he taught me um, was, was about really the erosion of the traditional understandings of very basic military ideas, such as battle, victory, bravery, and indeed the idea of war itself. Um, those of you that had the, the privilege of listening to his talk last week um, will know what I'm talking about. And if you didn't have that privilege, it's going to be online um, in the next few days. What I was able to contribute was some knowledge of the Catholic Church's teaching on war, both in the way that it taught before 1960s, when it was arguing mostly that wars should be just, and its more recent teaching, which is about it, the abhorrence of all war. But as we talked, I realized that the contemporary warfare has revealed something fundamental, something fundamental and horrible about the underlying nature of war. And I don't think this horrible something has been fully recognized by most students of war, including Catholic ones. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. I think understanding this horrible something will provide a deeper and sadder meaning than is commonly given to the statement of Pope John Paul II, that as he put it, quote, war is always a defeat for humanity. So I'm gonna talk about that and talk about its implications um, for what we should do about war. Um, and before I start, I should say that while Frank said nice words about this um, lecture, I, it's, these are my ideas and, um, and he doesn't get any blame for what I'm saying. I wanna start with the definition of war. What I understand war to be is the organized activity of killing and destroying that takes place between different polities. Um, that's a definition is not, too odd, but it has three somewhat unusual features. The first is something that's not there. This definition says nothing about a higher purpose of war, and claiming indeed that war does not need to aim at any of the goals that the philosophers, politicians, and generals often use to describe it. It doesn't have to aim at political gain, peace, justice, victory, conquest, serving the will of God or the gods, or even at individual or national honor. None of these is essential to war. War's essence is simply extreme violence. Wars are fought so that people can kill, wound, and inflict other types of damage on each other. Of course, war is an organized activity, and the organizers, the political authorities, do have purposes. They want victory, peace, honor, and so forth. And these desires help shape the beginnings, the conduct, and the endings of wars. However, my claim is that as far as war itself is concerned, all such goals are more like excuses than like motivations. 
They are the pious justifications permitted, provided for permitting the destructive violence that is the unchanging and underlying essence of all war. Later in this lecture, I'm going to explain why, how modern war reveals this destructive essence with stark clarity. So that was one unusual feature, that it's missing a purpose. The second unusual feature of my definition is in the description, is the description of the warring parties as polities instead of something like nations or states or sovereigns. I'm using this relatively unfamiliar word to emphasize that being in a war does not require much in the way of political administration. All that is necessary to qualify as a warring polity is that one side in the war considers a group of people to be a political unity with military implications, a we who are fighting or a them who we are fighting against. It's a low bar to cross. The polity's existence may be contested by many outsiders and even by many of its supposed members. It need not have an effective system of government. It may have actually no military capacity. You can be a polity just to be slaughtered. Now, the third feature of my definition of war is the preposition. War takes place between polities. The between is really crucial for my argument. War is almost the direct opposite of violence within polities. What I'm, what I'm calling political violence is, or supposed, is supposed to be under the polity's political control internal to it, while the violence of war, which is between polities, has no political control. The difference between the intra-polity political violence and the inter-polity Polity, political violence is the difference between essentially controlled violence and essentially uncontrolled violence. Now, most military historians and many philosophers of war would hotly deny that the violence of war is uncontrolled. For them, the practice of war is, or is supposed to be, something like a football match, an organized aggressive activity that is framed by rules of play and by standards of victory. These experts would point out that all the combatants at war accept some rules of fighting. For example, they have structures of command and they accept how we should declare war, start war, offer truces or exchange prisoners. The combatants may even agree that some weapons are out of bounds, impermissible. But by my definition, to the very limited extent that combat actually does resemble an extreme sporting event, fair play for all, then at that, to that extent, it's not really war. It is political violence within what might be called a temporary super polity. Now that may sound like a mere quibble over words, super polity, war, not war, but it actually reveals a deep disagreement about what is really going on in war. What the experts see is a combination of political machinations with a deadly sporting event. What I see is uncontrolled or barely controlled violence. In my judgment, the often broken rules of war, like the often lost purposes of war, are tributes to the ordered and controlled violence that is found within an any effective polity. But these fragments of order in war merely hide what, war, what makes war distinct among all permitted human activities, the unrestrained killing and destruction. So this difference that I am highlighting between political violence and war has a serious moral implication. The essential goal of political violence is good. It is the control of the human evil of violence. War, which has no essential goal other than the uncontrolled expression of this inherently evil violence. War is evil. This judgment that political violence serves the common good while the, war of, the violence of war is radically bad needs to be unpacked. And I'm gonna give you a five part explanation of why political violence is essentially good. The first step is to observe that political power always involves legitimate use of violence, always. The threat or at least, or the at least occasional practice of, and the at least occasional practice of officially approved physical coercion are always present in every polity, even in the most law abiding. 
Now, why? The second step is that we need, we use this official violence, this political violence, to control the human urge to be violently destructive. The urge to hurt others, the urge to violence, is found in all people who have ever lived. It is so prevalent and so powerful that it can only be controlled. It can never be removed totally from the hearts of sinful humanity. The third step of this argument is to explain why violence should be controlled in any polity. The reason is simple. The actual destruction that violence brings and the destructive fear that it brings with it hinder the fullness of life for all members of any polity. It's a bad thing, violence. And then comes the fourth step, my key political claim, that the political control of violence requires political violence. You can't control violence without the realistic threat of violence. It would be nice if this weren't true, but the, alternative to, the alternatives to violence, basically argument and peaceful incentives to behave nonviolently, will never be compelling enough to control the strong and fundamentally irrational urge to violence. So governments that are not capable of physically overpowering and restraining any member of the governed, they will quickly find themselves facing violent resistance that they will be unable to quell. The direct exercise of political violence may need to only to be occur occasionally, it can be rare, but for a government to retain its authority, the threat of violence must always be credible. Now, finally, this is a five-part argument. There is a moral conclusion. Political violence is always, always, in some ways, aims at the good, or a good, which is the communal good of living in peace and harmony. Morally, the situation with political violence is always going to be tricky, morally and practically, because the legitimate authorities must use violence, which inherently limits human flourishing, to promote nonviolent flourishing of the community. And practically, we know that the sad history of the world demonstrates just how easily governments yield to the temptation to use violence, not for the benefit of the government, but for their detriment. Still, the common misuse does not invalidate this essence of political violence. The need for political violence is indeed sad, but the purpose of this violence is essentially good to prevent much worse violence. Now we've learned something about the political violence in the 20th century. Thinkers such as including uh, Sigmund Freud, Marcel Eliade, and René Girard have shown, showed, they're all dead, um, that the efforts to control violence and to overcome its baleful effects on the community are woven into the deepest religious and social structures of any durable polity. Now, our secular societies have only weak religious structures, so we're going to have to rely on social and political structures. Um, and the political control of violence often includes what one might think of as quasi-religious social codes. And also it includes practices that allow minimally destructive rituals of aggression. I already mentioned one prominent example, professional and amateur sports. I could add the numerous bloodless, what we sometimes call them battles for commercial and professional success. In any case, all the manifestations of political violence always take place within some us, the people who live inside of and identify with a polity. That's exactly the opposite of war, which always involves violence against some group who, which is defined as not us and other. So war cannot be a form of political violence. Its violence is essentially unconstrained by all the controls and transformations that Eliade et al. have identified of, of political violence that can become transformed and controlled through political violence. The destruction and destructive fear that is created by that are created by war um, does they do what. I said all the uncontrolled violence does. They hinder the fullness of life. Unlike political violence, war has no higher virtuous end. It is simply destructive, it is simply evil.
Now, this observation brings me back in opposition to the old long-standing claim of experts that the killing of war is somehow part or can be part of civilized life. Not so, I repeat, the religious or and political logic which surround war, they're essentially shams. They only cover up and at best sometimes very mildly restrain the underlying evil of uncontrolled violence. Now, I have to admit that my claim that the violence of war is essentially uncivilized is not obviously supported by the historical evidence. Indeed, quite the contrary, until very recently, the fact of war, the glory of war, and the preparations of war have always and everywhere been deeply and noticeably unproblematically integrated into life in all civilizations. Numerous patriots, philosophers, and poets have seen virtues in soldiers' brave and willing sacrifices and in combat's intelligence, ingenuity, and camaraderie. Images of war, many of them quite favorable, still permeate all languages. But using one of those images, let me say that I do not lightly take up arms against this long tradition of conventional wisdom. Um, but I can take comfort from history, particularly from the fact that over the centuries, revelation, thinking, research, and experience have been sometimes, in fact, quite often, persuaded people of the incompleteness or outright error of long accepted claims of truth. And this is where the modern history of warfare comes into my argument. We can see war more clearly now, so we can judge it more appropriately. But before discussing what we see now in war, I want very briefly to go over two relevant examples of profound modern revisions of long-standing assumptions. First, the social unacceptable, un unacceptability of Jews, and then the practical inevitability of famines. These may seem irrelevant, but they will, not, they will come back. Start with anti-Semitism. After Christians took over polities, the New Testament, which had a theological dislike of Jews, that theological dislike quickly became and remained sociological. For almost 15 centuries, Jews in Christian countries were subject to numerous social constraints and were sometimes victims of political violence. The rightness of this basic hostility was almost never questioned even when, some, when violent, some of the violent manifestations of that hostility were widely condemned. Well into the 20th century, otherwise sensitive and moral people accepted what we would now call anti-Semitism as normal and basically even good. That approach to the Jews now seems inexplicably crude and cruel. How could good Christians have been so hostile to what Pope John Paul II called their older brothers of the covenant. How could good secularists not notice that their often extreme dislike of Jews violated their own fundamental principles of the equality of all citizens? I think the best answer to these questions is that it takes a great shock to make people rethink deeply entrenched attitudes. For anti-Semitism, of course, the necessary shock was provided by the remarkably successful Nazi effort to exterminate the Jews of Europe. Casual anti-Semites, many of whom had not been much bothered by Nazi extremism in the matter of the Jews before the slaughter began, eventually started to see things differently. Even then, it took at least two decades for anti-Semitism to become totally acceptable in many societies, and some it's still not, and for the Catholic Church to shift its official narrative about Judaism. On a personal note, I can say that when I spent a year in Coventry in 1968, my 12-year-old peers routinely criticized aggressive bargaining as Jewing someone down. So it hadn't reached Coventry in 1968. My point in bringing up this unpleasant history of anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism is that the genocidal experience eventually helped people notice a long ignored truth. The decision to belittle, ostracize, or hate particular religious or social group inserts a wedge into the human community, a division which can never be excused and which can always lead to the dehumanization and ultimately to the extermination of that neighbor. To paraphrase John Paul II's statement about war, 
Anti-Semitism can now be seen for what it always was, a defeat for humanity. And my second analogy, historical analogy, is famine. The certainty of occasional famines was almost unquestioned until sometime around 1970. The misery that often followed failures of harvests was accepted as part of the way the world worked, in accord with the inscrutable divine will. Although people tried to prevent and mitigate famines, famine, it was taken for granted that nature had placed severe limits on what could actually be done. It was and always would be simply impossible to find and move enough grain to keep everyone fed all the time. The advent of modern agriculture and transport, though, eliminated those limits. Famine can now always be averted anywhere in the world. And this non necessity of famine has actually been a fact for at least a century, and it could have been a fact in Europe, at least for a century, a century earlier, so say from 1800, if scientists, researchers, agronomists, and rulers had recognized the possibility. However, they didn't. On the contrary, for decades, the rapid increase in agricultural productivity received less attention than the first edition in 1798 of Thomas Malthus's um, claim um, his essay on population, that famines were the way that nature restrained the growth of human populations. They were part of nature's way. And neo-Malthusians were still predicting mass hunger in the 1960s. You can still talk, hear people talk about it. But actually, the economist Amartya Sen eventually persuaded experts that famines are now always caused by political decisions. He won the 1998 Nobel Prize for discovering this. It took a few years of mass murder to discredit anti-Semitism. It took many decades of the actual mass production of food to discredit Malthus. But at long last, the lesson was in fact learned. Famine is no longer considered a regrettable necessity. and Any mass hunger is now seen for what it is, a defeat for humanity. The overturning of one of the oldest beliefs about the human condition, the necessity of famine, I think lends credence to my claim that another ancient belief, the basically civilized nature of war, is also a misreading of the human condition. So I'll turn to the evidence about the evil of war now, provide that modern war provides. I'll summarize the grim lessons and their moral implications under five headings. First, arming non-combatants is now the center of warfare. As Frank explained last week, Traditional set-piece battles among basically willing soldiers are too destructive for any polity to bear. While smaller conventional military encounters still go on, but they're almost always too decisive to lead to the end of warfare. By far, the most effective military way to shift a political balance is through bombing, terrorism, and extreme physical and sexual violence against the civilian population. So war is now so far from civilized, in large part nothing but extreme violence by military forces against non-military lives, assets, and social structures. The implication of this fact of war, or our understanding of war, is that the notion that war is or should be basically a fair fight among willing combatants is just untrue. Why do I say that? Because if it were true, if that civilized understanding of war were accurate, then neither rulers nor armed forces would be willing to kill or wreck their lives of so many unarmed people whenever they think that such destruction will help their cause. So war is not a fair fight, it's something else. Second, modern war always, almost always verges on carnage, by which I mean killing, traditional word for total destruction, killing everyone, almost everyone, and then sexual, psychological, and physical humiliation of many of the people they aren't killed, the evisceration of existing political structures, the annihilation of existing economic capacity. A carnage, as Frank mentioned, is as old as war, but it is especially tempting when the destruction of non-combatants is already a prime target tactic. And the, the innovation of thinking that your cause should be just also has helped justify the obliteration of every support for the unjust opponents. 
the frequency of carnage in war often surprises people because they think that we have rules of war. But if you look at the last century, we've had all of the devastation of the Second World War, a slew of genocides around the world. Remember I said you don't have to have military force to be the victim of war. Um, and then the blind destruction of such, by such rebel groups as the Lord's Resistance Army in Boko Haram. And then there's also terrorism, which is a sort of mini carnage, destruction of civilian targets, concentrated carnage, which is now the weapon of choice for polities with very limited military resources. So what's the implication of this prevalence of carnage? It's that the notion that violence is basically controlled is wrong. Why do I say that? Because if political and military leaders wanted to avoid carnage, they easily could. Almost all armies today, even in search and grouping such as the military state, are overall more closely commanded and often better trained than at any time in history. So if we have carnage, it's because people want it. They think that's the way to fight. Third, the supposed virtues of warfare have become largely irrelevant. Honor, bravery, camaraderie, cunning and skill, bodily strength, you still have them. But all of these virtues, whether of character, of intelligence, or of physical fitness, they play only minor roles in actually deciding who wins or whatever the outcome is of a war. Victory is not a big concept in war today. Whenever there is something like a victory, which is increasingly rare, it comes primarily from technology, from having and using a superior quantity and quality of destruction, the tools of destruction. Bravery, well, the controllers of drones, guided missiles and cyber attacks, they don't need a lot of valor. And when there is bravery, there's not much glory in it. The bravery of a pilot bombing a hospital or a wedding in the face of anti-aircraft fire, it's hard to be praiseworthy about it. Nor is the willingness Similarly, for the willingness of a suicide bomber in a marketplace to give up his life for the cause. The implication of this disappearing valor in war is that the nobility of soldiering is, can't be at the center of war, hence the long-standing claims. If it were, then if it were really central, then commanders would not have so willingly made it irrelevant to how we fight or how we win wars. So fourth in my list of five is that war now aims at the destruction, not the continuation of politics. In other words, modern reality has almost reversed the claim of, of the military theoretician Karl von Clausewitz that, quote, war is a continuation of politics by other means, a very famous quote. <clears throat> Today's wars, that kind of idea requires that imagined super polity that I mentioned earlier in the lecture, a temporary political structure that includes rival political authorities that find ways to fight each other with a sort of limited gain and goal and casualties. Not true. Today's war is aim almost exclusively at the destruction of the, of the opponent's polity. When the, original, when the original political goals are modest, actual fighting often reads, leads to more and more destructive fury. And even when the anger dies down, the fighting often continues without any, without any clear political purpose. <laughs> Just as long as there's money to be made or fun to be had from killing, threatening, looting, and destroying your enemies, and even often your supposed allies. The implication of this end of politically sensible warfare, a politically oriented warfare, her understanding of war is simple again, is that the only plausible explanation for war is the desire of people to be free of the controls of their violent urges, the controls that political violence enforces. Why do I say that? Well, there's been no need for this kind of violent solution to political quarrels for through a century. The League of Nations first and then the United Nations were established exactly as those Clausewitzian super polities or something like them with the explicit purpose of avoiding wars 
to arbitrate disputes and if necessary to use military force to discipline their members. Of course, the UN and the League of Nations are not perfectly fair and just, but they're much more fair and more just than wars ever could be. And they're even quite effective when they are relied on. Um, but the appeal of uncontrolled violence has been far too great to resolve political disputes within a nonviolent framework. War is about violence. It's about satisfying that appeal. Okay, and this leads, these four observations lead to a final lesson, which is that war can almost never be just. Even if the goal of war is hypothetically just, for example, to overthrow an oppressive government or defend an existing um, government from an unjust invasion, it is almost impossible that the justice obtained by success will outweigh the injustice wrought by fighting. It's just too much harm is done in warfare so that few governments are sufficiently unjust in their actions to merit the sort of punishment that war will bring. And the implications of this inherent injustice, this almost ubiquitous injustice, is that there is limited overlap between justice and any war. If wars were essentially connected to justice, then the unjust suffering of war would not be so universally tolerated, let alone so frequently welcomed. So if the unjust, if the essence of war is uncontrolled violence, then attempts to turn war into political violence are almost doomed to fail. As soon as, as long as there is war, the compelling drive to carnage and to overpower promises of restraint. Perhaps once the forces of custom and piety were strong enough to limit war, violence and war, but if that was ever true, and the evidence is at best mixed. It was in a more religious age when the available and when the available technology was less destructive. Now the appeal of this destructive violence against that other is too great to be restrained by mere rituals or well-intentioned words. I want to pause and for I want to talk for a few minutes about those words that were used to deter war. Five centuries of failed efforts to diffuse the causes of war, to constrain the fury of fighting. We've had popes, philosophers, leading jurists, and many conscientious kings and politicians try various types of anti-war words. We've had solemn commitments only to fight wars for just causes, Commitments to avoid excessive and unfair destruction once war has started, and commitments never to engage in wars at all. There have been a few successes, perhaps, but the overall history of fighting against war with words is a history of failures. I want to point to the 1928 Kellogg Briand Pact. It was signed by every leading military power in the night of the time. All of them signing up to the clause that they would not go to war over, quote, disputes or conflicts of whatever nature, of whatever origin they may be, which may arise among them. Wonderful quote, wonderful idea. It's included in the Charter of the United Nations, which was founded after almost every signatory nation had spared no effect, effort in their drive to bring more carnage in the Second World War. No, words don't work, but it shouldn't be a surprise because principles have so little to do with the essence of war. Wars take place in the tempting and instinctual world of unprincipled, uncivilized, primordial violence. On their own, even the most sincere vows of restraint are not powerful enough to control the violence of war. They do not even come close. And I should note that this this failure to control war stands in sharp contrast with the increasing effect effectiveness of the political violence that I mentioned before. In contrast to almost all periods of history, few people in most parts of the world now normally carry weapons in daily life, and fewer of them use them. The American police violence may seem like an exception of the last few weeks, but even that remains far less uncontrolled than the lynchings in that country of less than a year ago. 
And the U.S. is something of an exception in its reliance on violence. In most of the world, politically approved violence is now largely limited to actual sports, I mentioned, and video fantasies. And political violence itself has become less violent, less reliant on actual violence. No more public executions, which were once a popular entertainment. And capital punishment itself has become extremely rare. So this pacification of life within polities makes the continuing inability to control war even more instructive. We constrain the violence of everyday life with great energy, but we hardly try to restrain the violence of war. Here, the historical analogies are, are directly relevant in a dark way. Much as the pre-modern restraints of a religiously inspired moral code may have softened the inherent control, cruelty of despising Jews, pre-modern religious awe sometimes somewhat softened the inherent carnage of war. And much as pre-modern primitive technology hid the potential human ability to avoid famine, the limits of pre-modern technology and society sometimes tempered the inherently uncontrolled violence of war. Modern shifts have, have revealed the dark truth about war, just as they've revealed the dark truth of anti-Semitism and the dark, the more cheerful truth about the nature of famine. They've revealed the dark truth of war that it is essentially a large-scale manifestation of, to use two phrases of Kant, the radical evil in human nature of the crooked timber of which humanity is built. So we take on this political, the control, to, the political responsibility to control violence. That's why we live, we are capable and we do. That's why we have always, humans have always lived in organized polities with governments authorized to use political violence. And we, we recognize this. We can only be fully human, our true selves, when these authorities restrain and neutralize the violence in our nature. John Paul really was deeply right. War, which is where this violence is not restrained, not neutralized. War is a defeat for the truth about humanity. Now, the last bit I want to talk about briefly is, is this defeat necessary? I don't think so. And again, I think the historical analogies are relevant, this time more optimistically. Once anti-Semitism and famines had been recognized for what they truly are, they could be and they mostly have been tamed. I believe, or perhaps I just hope, that once the true and horrible essence of war is fully recognized, they too can be tamed. The recent success in controlling political violence can show the way to transform and control well, the success in, in exercising political violence can show the way to transform and control the cravings for war into forms of violence that, like political violence, are limited, repressed, or fully sublimated. This right now may well be a strange time for the such, to express such optimism, as few world leaders seem interested in the very hard work required to dull the appeal of war's uncontrolled violence. Still, like the urge for violence, the hope for peace is part of the human condition. I have eight suggestions of ways to discourage war. First two for thinking about war, and then six for acting against it. First, in thinking about war, abandon all traces of the old conventional acceptance. Accept that war is essentially and radically evil. Second, once we accept that evil, admit how tempting this evil of war actually is. Recognizing, recognize that the glory and glamor of war are deeply embedded in our psychology, our cultures, our political systems, indeed our language. Once we've thought about it, we can turn to actions. And the, my third suggestion is we should teach against war as we teach against any evil. Extensive education in the evils of war is necessary to balance its great appeal. Fourth, we should commit to the unending hard work of what Catholics writers on war often describe as peace building. 
Building peace requires far more psychological and practical efforts than building up armories of war. Fifth, we must be thorough and consistent. Pope Francis is right to say that peace is always possible. War can be resisted from long before the beginning to well after the end by offering alternatives, by pointing out war's futility and evil, by proposing specific peaceful compromises before and during fighting, by suggesting calm joint military action rather than furious unilateral attack, and by promoting the true flourishing of all the qualities involved whenever there is war after the destruction stops. Sixth, we can recognize that just war thinking is unlikely to help much. At the heart of warfare, there is always violence, not justice. And any positive consideration of just wars, of just war, tends to obscure the reality of that violence, of that unjust violence. Still, politically controlled violence against a great and violent injustice may sometimes be advisable. And the just war tradition can be helpful here. It sets the right standards to fight only when stringent conditions are met, to fight only as justly, and in a more recent addition to the teaching, to be responsible for restoring justice after fighting. In Latin, use ad bellum, use in bello, and use post bellum. Seventh, to avoid unrealistically simplistic pacifism. There can be something like justice in something like war. It is sometimes better for outsiders to impose order with deadly force than to let weak governments fail to do so, or than to let wicked governments engage in war against their own, their own or against neighboring peoples. And total disarmament is also unrealistic because the presence of military forces can deter as well as encourage war just as police forces can deter as well as encourage violence within a polity. My final suggestion is to work on the very difficult virtue of forgiveness. Once again, Pope John Paul II is worth quoting, and I quote, forgiveness always involves an apparent short-term loss trade in exchange for a real long-term gain. Forgiveness may seem like weakness, but it demands great spiritual strength and moral courage both in granting it and accepting it. It leads to a fuller and richer humanity. And I will conclude with the melancholy observation that the history of Christians at war is not filled with forgiveness. Indeed, it is not filled with anything like bold anti-war actions, but better late than never. The magisterium of the Catholic Church is now firmly opposed to war. Its teachers now have to persuade worshipers and the world of what modern war has made clear to those with, with eyes to see. That war is indeed profoundly a defeat for humanity. And with that, thank you, and we'll take some questions which I hope have gathered. Okay, uh, yes, we've got several questions, and uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Conrad's, uh, where he's got two. The first is this, your definitions of war and political violence are quite ideal, typical, bad versus good, between versus interior. But what about those ambivalent phenomena, civil war, ethnic conflict, revolution transferring it, transforming itself into armed conflict? Can we describe, can we describe war and armed conflict by such a pronounced distinction? Can we do that? Yeah, um, I will, can answer that. Um, Indeed, I wanted to define war exactly that way because I wanted to include civil war and insurrection as war. Um, and the point there is that if one side thinks it's a polity, then it becomes a war. And that that's a relevant idea because in a civil war, say the US Civil War, the North said it wasn't really a war, um, at, at least at first, because they, they took the this declaration of secession as um, as an illegal act, so in their their mind. Um, but I don't. I think that it is a war um, as long as you. Um, I, I want to define it as a war because it has the characteristic of war. Once it get, takes on the uncontrolled violence of war, it is a war. 
and, and that's that's why I, I want to do that. Now that said, the boundaries are always going to be fuzzy, um, and that that's certainly true of any definition of war. Um, and so one can define it, and one side may say this is a war, and the other side will say this is a police action. Um, but that's just where we are um, in 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 that kind of in this kind of definition. But I want to have the war to be a very broad category because I think that corresponds more to what people mean by war. All right then. Uh, and Dr. Conrad asks a second question here. The essence of war is unlimited violence, quoting you, I think, there. Yeah. Does this definition not underplay the economic and other interests that cause and prolong war? Is what we'll call um, it causes, I suppose. How do we stop yeah. it if we can't deal with the dynamics behind it? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, I spent most of my life, as Frank mentioned, um, in, in economic world. And we have lots of economic so-called wars. We have trade wars. Um, we have um, competitive wars, wars for market share. Um, I remember very early in my career, um, I used to follow as an analyst the advertising industry. And I subscribed to an American periodical that had a headline about um, excitement in the shampoo trade. And it said, it was like World War III in the supermarket aisles. And it was my first publication ever, um, was a letter to Advertising Age in which I said, we can all hope that World War III will be like the shampoo trade wars um, to get market shell space. Um, so war as a metaphor and war as caused by, or their issues of economy, sure. Um, but what I'm interested in is not what causes war, or what the excuses are, but what happens, which is we take an economic issue that might well be solved in some other way. We're upset about poverty or about, um, um, about water usage or about whatever it is that our reasoning for war is. Um, what's distinct is that we decide to solve that problem via violence, by a deadly violence. Um, we have other mechanisms now, and always could, for solving this kind of problems. We have arbitration, we have courts, um, we have negotiations, but, um, and most economic problems, most economic disputes are indeed solved without violence. What interests, what I think is crucial is that we get into war as compared to um, 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 an economic dispute. If I might steal or abuse privilege, uh, yeah, I think this is a, a, interesting. Your, your term, um, term you use primordial violence, which I suppose Burkhard there summarizes rightly as the essence of war is unlimited violence. That's one of the pillars of the Clausewitz, you whom you mentioned, considers to be um, one of the pillars of, of war that Clausewitz defines, the other two being chaos within which creativity may roam, as he puts it. And reason and uh, policy that it's called usually or the, very often called the remarkable trinity I think what you're doing is you're removing the reason and policy element of that now Clausewitz is descriptive rather than prescriptive you are perhaps a little bit more prescriptive uh, would that would that be are you removing at least one of the three pillars of that tripod the yeah I think that's right um, yeah I, I I mean, I, I'm sort of coming at it from a slightly different angle um, because Clausewitz is interested in, in the idea of, it, of, of, of that policy being absolutely essential to war. And I am trying to, to say that that's, as it were, um, a framing that we give to war rather than at, at, at the core of it. Um, but perhaps, you know, perhaps unfairly, perhaps Clausewitz, who's you know, obviously a great scholar and thoughtful person, um, is is right. I mean, and in some way, there that that's. It is obviously there is there are obviously because there's a polity involved. There are polities involved. There are political elements to it. So in that sense, it's right. But what I'm trying to get at is what we're doing when we are fighting, as compared to other means of negotiating with pol of polities. So it it you know he's certainly right. I just think that that misses what's distinct about war in comparison to other kinds of political action. Well, he, he says that on several occasions that the essence of war is schlacht, 
I think in German means killing or battle slaughter sometimes. Yeah, so you know, I think we're we're pretty much in in accord. And of course, his inspiration was in Napoleonic Wars, which had an awful lot of killing, um, and by the end, not a whole lot of clear polity um, there. So uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, it just occurred to me while you were talking, I'm, I'm looking here at uh, Burkhard's question that it's British policy now rather belatedly. Even defence policy is based around something they call upstream engagement, which is I know, a buzzword, obviously. But the idea is you can use armed force rather to as as a preventative measure by training security forces to pre preventing uh, violence from exploding, as it were. Do you think there's a role for military forces in either peacemaking or, I suppose? Legally speaking, what's called Chapter Seven UN operations, peacemaking, or Chapter Six, as I recall it anyway, peacekeeping. Is there a role for military forces in your view, Edward? Well, yeah, I, I mean, there has to be. You know, so as I say, there's a window where you say um, there, that that some kind of military action is needed because there is a military. Um, you know, there's there's slaughter has started or is imminently threatened. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I, I think one can't say there's no role for military action, and I I, I did try to, to to put that in. Um, I, I think that a lot of the time when when we get involved in military action, um, those kind of considerations um, are are secondary, and the, the core really has to be that you do have political control because then it it changes the nature of the action, the essence of it from schlock to actual um, um, actual political um, political violence as much as you possibly can, so that you take responsibility um, in fighting, and, and that's certainly. I'm not an expert on the UN, but it's certainly philosophically what the UN's idea was, is that you would be um, not engaged in warfare, but in a sort of police action, either to prevent warfare um, or to, to stop it, to, to protect peace. Um, so the idea that, that what you're doing in the UN is political violence um, is, 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 uh, is, I think, really pretty central. And to that extent, yeah, sometimes you're going to have to have some pretty extreme violence, just as you sometimes need political violence to be quite strong in a very disordered state within a disordered state. Is that an exception to your prescription against, uh, against war then? Um, or international peace and security, as the UN Charter puts it? Yeah, I don't know if it's an exception. I think that it, it, it is... Um, it is the, I, I'm against pacifism. So in a sense, I'm, I'm, I'm arguing against simplistic pacifism. Um, I think there's a lot of room we can have to try to reduce effectively, um, minimize war through thinking of it as evil. Um, when you get to the end of it, um, you may need to have something that looks a lot like what we would call war um, because that's the way it is. But I don't think we ever need to um, get involved in this kind of civilian destruction, killing of non-combatants as the essence of war, that seems to me totally unnecessary because that's outside of the political understanding of the destructive the ending of violence. Well, I think here's the most difficult one which from Mrs. Barty, who asks, what simple steps can we take to teach against war in primary schools? Whoa, that's a difficult question. Um, well, it's a good question. I, I, I really need to, would need to give it some more thought to answer that. I haven't really thought about, uh, I mean, I raised my children to not like war, so I guess I had some idea when it was there, when I was doing it, but, um, um, and I remember we, I had, have, still have two boys, although they're now in their um, 30s and 40s, um, and they used to fight quite regularly, and we would not discourage them because we understood this as ritualized violence and accepted that as part of, of, of life. Um, and so I think something having to do with understanding that, that violence is part of the way we 
deal with the world and to understand how you have to teach how to control it um, and use it in ways that are um, not um, destructive as much as you can. Um, that that's that's really the the core to to uh, to education. But I really would have to give this a lot more thought. Yeah, and of course there's, there's some some who consider consider uh, violence to be to be innate, it's an essential element of evolutionary psychology, rather derived from our evolutionary psychological development. Uh, yep. Um, or else, you know, if you want to go for another kind of psychological model, it's something that comes in with original sin, you know, um, after Cain slew Abel. Um, so we, we get into, uh, you know, it's certainly very deep in the human condition, and to control it is a very great challenge. Okay, so Damien Hopton asks, is the problem the word just... Uh, should we be looking at certain conflicts as necessary? I suppose this comes back to just war theory, doesn't it? And, yeah. Um, and coming up with new doctrine, and this is, uh, this is an interesting element to the question. Sorry to interrupt, Edward, but he says, coming up with a new doctrine that lays out when violence might be necessary, but dropping just war doctrine. Now, that, that would seem to fit with what you said over the last few minutes. Yeah, I like that idea. Um, I hadn't really thought of it quite those terms, necessary versus just. I'll write that down. Um, yeah, because... We do, have, we do have last resort, though, in the just war doctrine, in the just war. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, there's, there's implicit in there is the idea of necessary. But I think it's important to do a little bit of history here. Is the just war doctrine um, was developed as an anti-war doctrine in the 16th century, um, Augustine and, and Thomas Aquinas, who are sort of often credited, or, or even Cicero, of understanding, of sort of introducing the, the idea, um, their idea of, of war, of justice in war, was a pretty low threshold. Um, they, they took war for granted, and there's a very good argument in Thomas's case, Thomas Aquinas, that, that what he's trying to do in his very brief discussion of war is to justify the crusades, the, the fight for the Holy Land, to explain how that would pass um, a normal definition for, for a reasonable cause of war. And so from the beginning, just war has had a very ambiguous relationship to anti-war. Um, and it was used as an anti-war doctrine by the Spanish jurists, mostly Dominicans, here at Blackfriars, it's good to mention that, um, in the 16th century. And it was revived again at the end of the 19th century, along with what was then a brand new word. It was coined for the time of pacifism to try and be strongly anti-war. Um, and so I'm not sure that the whole approach to just war, which has always been ambiguous about war, is really right, and maybe we do need to restart that um, and think about necessary violence, which would go along with political violence as necessary, um, and would, would perhaps getting taking justice out of the equation. So, yeah, I'm I'm quite warm on that that suggestion. And further to that, then uh, Burkhard comes back to you and says he's struggling with the definition of good political violence geared towards a common good that you, you framed, I think, or seem to frame. Doesn't violence in itself have an evil core and covering a moral dilemma that sometimes we simply are not able to solve our conflicts peacefully? Um, yes, yes, and yes. I mean, it's all difficult. Um, I, I, I use the word tricky, but there's a kind of conflict here that 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 is, um, um, and and this is where some of those those sort of sociologists, anthropologists come in to be very helpful. Is you realize that violence is necessary. There are things we seem to be incapable of dealing with without violence, um, at least in our fallen condition. And you realize how painful and difficult it is for societies, how we have so many rituals of punishment and purification. And um, so it is necessary and it does certain kinds of violence do serve the common good. We punish criminals. We 
we take them out of circulation in one way or another, um, and um, we, we violently constrain people. Um, so we, we do need some kind of, of, of approved violence, and yet violence is itself inherently destructive and, and evil. So it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a big problem. Um, not an easy solution that we can come up with. Well, uh, Talia Gaza points out to you, she, she, I suppose, identifies this cleavage that you make between political violence and war, but you say, or hint, that war is evil, political violence is justified. Uh, could you uh, elaborate a bit more on that, she asks? Sure. <laughs> okay. So uh, what I'm trying to get at here is I'm trying to get at the idea that War is um, is essentially different from political violence because it lacks that rich web network of meanings and, um, and and controls that political violence has. And often, when people defend war, they talk about it as if it were political violence. So they'll talk about trophies and the treaties and the negotiations, and we'll have pictures of, of you know, the fancy uniforms and, and sort of the glamour of it. And it will look very much like, a, a, say, a religious ritual, marching off to war. Um, and there's, there's all this symbolic um, um, cover to it. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that modern war has, as it were, I think I used this in the title, stripped away that cover. But the cover is not a cover for political violence. It is actually there. It's what political violence is, is the ability or the task of controlling, sublimating, limiting violence um, in, in, inside a society. And so they really are radically different um, despite the appearances of the, the, the sometimes similar appearances. Um, of, of, of being ordered forms of violence. One really is an ordered form of violence. It really is integrated into social, um, into the, the way that we live in society. And one is really underneath a disordered form of violence. So they're really quite different, I'm arguing. I don't know, obviously a lot of people wouldn't accept that. Um, but I think, so I think it's a controversial point. But I obviously I think it's I'm right and they're wrong, but that that's a debate to be had. And where do nuclear weapons fit into your analysis? Asks Anne Dodd. Um, nuclear weapons fit in really well on the um, killing civilians is the center of war. Like, nuclear weapons are not a useful battlefield tool, um, although people have thought they might be. Um, they are only useful in order to. Um, it's the doctrine these days, shock and awe to, to, um, to kill civilians. Um, and the idea that one could use them is already an admission that what we're doing in warfare is, is killing non-combatants. And so the idea that the center of war is random destruction or total destruction, nuclear weapons are sort of case number one for that. that uh, Evidence number one for that case. Or even global destruction. That seems yeah, to be a yeah. natural consequence of these good, yeah, global destruction. Yeah. All right, so Colette asks, how far is the uncontrolled violence of war a male phenomenon? And connected to that, when we see the uh, women more involved in co conflict and combat or the advancement of women in society as combatants and victims, uh, does that change the understanding of war and indeed the authorities and polities that are sanctioned? Um, aspect, I suppose. Well, that's a big question um, and takes us into another domain. Um, so I'm not going to answer it directly exactly. I mean, all I will say is historically, war has always been very heavily identified with men, partly because it demands ultimate physical strength. Um, and partly because it's been one of the touchstones of masculinity, possibly part of the um, part of the anti-war campaign has to do with what do we call them now, gender roles. And so one wants to think about that. 
Um, but if women are fighting in wars and killing, killing people, then we might have to think about the masculine feminine distinction, but I don't think it really changes the argument about war per se very much. Um, certainly, um, no, I, yeah, I would just say that. Yeah, just limit there, stop there. All right then, so Richard, Richard Gibbs uh, asks this concerning what some combatants or soldiers might regard as a cure war. Uh, in, in the sense that there were no civilians, or very few, there were three civilians in the case that he mentions rightly involved, that's the Falklands War. So in that war you had two armed forces arguing or fighting over a particular and clearly defined objective, or some have a different perspective, but anyway. So was it then a true war, given that civilians or non-combatants were not involved, or is it atypical, and is it therefore not a war? Um, good question. Um, yeah. Um, well, it's certainly a war in the sense that it was the violence of killing people. Um, it was not a modern war in the sense that I've described, um, in that it was soldier against soldier. Um, and not civilians weren't involved. It was certainly an exception in, in, in so many ways. I mean, it was sort of anachronism in war. Um, the British going to defend a colony and what was left of their navy and the Argentines and, and you know, an almost equally bizarre method. Um, uh, so it, it, it was really, um, you know, if, if, if it's, it's an exception that isn't going to sort of isn't going to demonstrate much about the 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 the, the, the rule, um, and you know it's interesting that that uh, um, prior to the war there hadn't been much fighting about this, you know, much conflict over it, and after the war we just returned back to the status quo. Um, similarly with Gibraltar and other little on colonial enclaves. Um, that, that you know, we, we, we can live peacefully with these things. And in that sense, that war reinforces my idea that people like fighting and that's why they go to war. It wasn't a need to fight that war. Um, and in that sense, it was, you know, it was fought and in that case clearly won um, by, um, by killing people. So I don't think it doesn't qualify as war. It just doesn't have the same center of modern war that most modern wars have. Of killing civilians. I think most most uh, practitioners would say that it was uh, an anomaly and it, it, perhaps an anachronism. Um, yeah, in that sense, for that reason. He also goes on to ask, in the war, it, it, wrong, he says, also most wars, most combatants didn't fire their weapons or don't actually aim at the enemy. Doesn't that speak against the idea of wars essentially to do with glamour and glory? I wonder if I might steal that because that's quite interesting. The, the, the comment is based on a, uh, a survey which was conducted, I think, after the Second World War, which was a survey on conscript troops who often weren't particularly American conscript troops who often weren't particularly well trained. Studies now would indicate that 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 we're not talking. I think that the figure was something like five percent had actually fired their weapons at the enemy that figure would now be 90 to 95% because armies are largely professional or uh, volunteers. And certainly that would be my experience of soldiers. Very, very few will not engage the enemy. Uh, yeah, and I mean, there, there was a, a, a lot of discussion about this in, in the US Civil War, which was again, a poorly trained right, yeah. And it turns out that even if a big chunk of the soldiers don't want to kill each other and um, don't kill each other, don't fire. Um, there are enough who will do the do job to cause remarkable amounts of slaughter. And um, my understanding is that actually a lot of conscripts who wouldn't, didn't want to fire um, eventually would, I mean, when under stress. Um, you know, the, U the U.S. Army in, 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 in its invasion asked the, the a lot of it, there wasn't a lot of resistance, so you could go and not be shot at and not have to shoot. But when you were being shot at, that often brings out the, the, 
the desire to shoot back. Um, so, so I'm not concerned about that. I mean, yeah, you know, people aren't, fortunately, our desire for violence isn't so uncontrolled, even in war, that we can't, at least sometimes, some of us not exercise it to the fullest, but that doesn't really, that doesn't change the basic force of war, which is to let us have as much violence as we want at a particular moment. Not every soldier engages in mass rape, but there's enough soldiers who will that sexual violence becomes part of the techniques of, of, of warfare in, 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 you know, in certain battles, conflicts. Uh, Richard asks or finishes his question with the state or the question uh, doesn't this speak against the idea of wars essentially do with glamour and glory? Or, or I'll just make a comment there that uh, I strongly recall being the presence of many soldiers for whom um, the idea of engaging the enemy is very much glamorous. And uh, we see that, by the way, in the I'll, I'm not, I'll say no more than this in the um, mediafication, horrible words, no, it's a non word. Of war, and that soldiers will now very commonly wear cameras, not for purposes of uh, oversight, but in order to recall what happened and to show it to their friends and publicize it. Very, very much in that old idea of glamour and glory. Yeah, you know, it's, I, I think, I think, I think glamour and glory are very much on the minds of people when they engage in, in fighting. Yeah. One of the reasons I think that people don't want to notice how little personal fighting has to do with victory because it just takes away the glamour of it to say, you know, actually it was all won by a bunch of bombers that weren't even being fought, fired at. Uh, do much for you. Okay. Uh, if the other parties asks Damien, surround their legitimate target with non-competence and you're likely to hit them if you conduct a strike, would that still be a legitimate target? The law law has a perspective on this. What's your perspective? Um, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, no, basically, but it's, it's, uh, um, what you want to do is not get into this position. Um, you want to try and think about how you don't get into wars because you recognize that once you get into war, what's going to happen, especially if you're the stronger force, is that the weaker force will use everything it can, including killing civilians, to fight against you. And making you kill civilians or they killing civilians, um, that's just gotten to be the essence, as I say, it's at the core of modern war. Um, so it, it just demonstrating that that um, war is about this kind of uncontrolled violence. Um, how you try and deal with it once you get into this horrible situation, um, I, I, that's up, up for the, the you know the the rules of of, of actual of fighting, which Frank knows a lot more about than I do. So. Yeah, the rules would say that if your military gain outweighs the damage to non-combatants, then you you can you can make the strike in law. Uh, by the way, British doctrine now is zero civ civilian casualties and in uh, current just war thinking, there, are, there is a stream of philosophical thought which uh, flows into this idea of, that for no reason can non-competence be a legitimate target, which brings us to Samuel Burke's point, which is, in your, is your position, he asks, analogous to the new natural law school, Grise, Finesse, Finesse, I should say, and so on, that the intentional killing of others is always immoral and can never be justified in any circumstances. Is that where you stand with the natural law, the new natural, new natural laws? Yeah. Um, well, um, I'm, I'm not an expert on the new natural law theory, and I'm not basically a huge fan of what I know about it, um, because I'm, I, I think intentional killing I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic to this idea, but this is going to get you into capital punishment, which is part of um, political violence traditionally. And I'm not sure that one can condemn, I mean, the Catholic Church now does condemn capital punishment, um, uh, absolutely. But I'm not sure that the, the, the moral argument would absolutely um, prohibit 
intentional killing within the context of political violence. So I'm a little bit reluctant to go down this road. Okay. Well, we're, uh, we're cruising now to a close. It's quarter past seven. Um, but uh, there is one other point made by Mrs. Barty here, which I wanted to leave to, till last, unless anyone else wishes to come in. And she, she, uh, she asked the question, coming back to that primary school question, mm -hmm. and she makes the point that in history and RE subjects, heroes of, uh, I think, implicit in what she's saying, heroes are very regular military heroes or military type heroes. You look at the Bible, or that matter, the Quran or the Old Testament, at any rate, um, and the Quran, various other narratives. So, how, how do you approach that then? Because a lot of that, particularly, I mean, I'm thinking of some Old Testament examples. Of glory and honor was, was, was what it was all about. Yeah, absolutely. And so you really have to think about this. Um, and, um, um, you know, we, we change how we teach history. We read the Bible differently. Um, I think a lot of people now reading the Bible would not emphasize the battles and the slaughter and, um, you know, the rules of if you were teaching about God telling Saul to slaughter all the Amalekites and rejecting him as king because he didn't slaughter quite all of them, um, including the women and children, we don't say, well, that just goes to show. Um, so, I mean, to give a very concrete example, in, the, in the, the catechism of the Council of Trent at the end of the 16th century, there are two paragraphs on war. Um, one lists very briefly the, the criteria. Uh, one says, doesn't even start talking about just war. It just talks about that if you fight um, in a just war, um, you're, it's not murder. Um, so uh, soldiers, legitimate soldiers are, are, um, are not committing a sin in fighting. And the second one says that if carnage is ordered by God, it's not a sin. So they're worrying about possibility that it might not be just to slaughter all the Amalekites. And that's it. That is all the Catholic Church has to say about war in the end of the 16th century. Um, no suggestion that war is, un is uh, in the catechism, that war is a bad idea or anything like that. It just says carnage is sometimes allowed when God tells you to. And we don't teach it that way. I mean, I think it would be hard put to find a school in what used to be Christendom that would say, we got to talk about the terms when carnage is allowed um, and when God talks to you about it. Um, so we change the way we teach. We change the heroes we present. We change our judgments of those heroes, parts of their lives that we're willing to claim. And it's perfectly possible to say that people didn't understand war. Um, you know, the, the New Testament is full of, of you know, a particular example of divorce, of a teaching that was one teaching and has changed to another teaching. Um, and it's possible to say that as we have lived in our history and we have seen things in modern history that we can change the way we think about them as we do about anti-Semitism or about famine. And I think we should do that about war. And yeah, as I say, it involves a lot of work. Um, and I, I, you know, I thank, the, thank you for that question because I think it's, uh, um, you, you're highlighting just exactly how much work it, it's going to involve. Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons I brought up the, the, uh, um, um, the, the, the failure of, of anti-war efforts in the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, because they didn't put anywhere near enough work in to trying to figure out how to get rid of war. Okay, at that, I think we'll, we should probably stop. Um, thank you all very much um, for attending. Thank you, Frank, and um, thank you for arranging this all. Thanks.